I have the privilege of going over some room and fill information here, the room and fill tab that is uh, unique to NDS. And uh, room and fill, you know, it's it's what we cannot see. It's a little few play on words here, but I, if you've seen me present from Minor Institute, I'm sure you've seen this diagram. I had a really good uh, co-worker that could work wonders with it, with uh, PowerPoint that created that, but <clears throat> that's basically what we're looking at. You know, how full is too full, and how full do we need to keep that room in? But one of the, you know, <clears throat> NDS provides uh, some estimates and predictions on room and fill values based on this U240 NDF. And as you can see here, these are snippets from the program itself. And the, cur the, the pink arrow showing UNDF of this diet at 0.37% of body weight, uh, approaching what we originally re recommended as a gut fill max of 0.4. And then over here, when you open up this specific room and fill tab, the 137 is percent body weight shows up. I have received frequent questions um, based on discussions that I've done and Rick has done and Van Amberg has given talking about U240 relative to gut fill. Um, I, we receive questions as why do those recommendations and values not always match? what we find in NDS. And there's a number of reasons for that, um, some of which I'm going to hand off to Emiliano to talk about. But one of the primary reasons is what I'm about to show you. And I wanted to use that original study to discuss in more detail where these recommendations came from and to provide some new thought on UNDF and U30, basically, relative to gut fill. So as you recall, or maybe you haven't seen this information, uh, while at Minor, I was overseeing a study looking at the percent forage of the diet relative to the NDF digestibility of that forage. And they were heavy corn silage diets with a little bit of grass silage. So everything here, keep that in mind, corn silage and grass forage rations. Forage level was either high or low, as indicated high forage at 68%, high forage 63%. Digestibility of the corn silage was managed um, through the, the variety. We had conventional corn and we had uh, BMR as the high NDFD forage. Pre-trial analysis of all the feeds, uh, that's what you have to base everything on to set the diets for the treatment, indicated that um, we had to feed, because this was such a high starch corn silage, we had to feed more of it to get equivalent NDF proportions of the trial diets between the BMR and the corn silage. And you can see back then, we weren't even on 30 hour. We were still using 24, 24 hour NDFD, these values of the whole diet. But I want to skip down to this row here, UNDF, OM, 240 hour, the 10 day undigested fiber residue of the two primary diets. When we're talking gut fill, we're really talking forage gut fill. And when we had a U240 of the whole diet, the whole TMR, grains and forages of 10%, as you see in the next slide, this treatment condition was gut fill limiting. On the low BMR diet, when our U240 of the entire diet dry matter basis was seven, we were tending towards acidosis in those cows. And that's a whole different lecture. But I'm providing these numbers here just to show what the entire forage NDF and UNDF profile of the treatments were. Most of the uh, NDF 
was from the forage, 79% um, here and 75% in the BMR. Okay, <clears throat> treatment results and the yellows are significant. Significantly less dry matter intake. Um, these are in kilos, so we're talking nearly three kilos, six, seven pounds of less dry matter intake, resulting in significant reduction in milk, reduction in energy corrected milk. High corn silage diet of low digestibility, gut fill limiting, severely impacted production. When we look at the intake of ANDFOM in kilos, we notice that these three diets were identical, only on the high digestible NDF diet did we get more NDF intake. As a percent of body weight, these three diets, identical percent body weight intake of NDF, the BMR allowed higher NDF intake. When we look at the U240 intake as a percent of body weight, we see that on the high forage low digestibility, approaching 0 0.4, 0 0.38% of body weight of U240 from the total diet, we thought, oh, she can't eat that much U240. That's a gut fill limiter. Anything below 0.3% of diet, we thought, hmm, we're borderline acidotic. That's what those cows are indicating. Okay. We had cannulated cows, and we were able to evacuate the rumen contents and analyze that, and that's what this table is here. And when we did that, we found that um, kilos of NDF uh, varied slightly, but not significantly. Only in the low BMR diet did we see a reduction in the kilos of NDF in those rumens, probably because the fiber is digesting so quickly and disappearing. The U240, four kilos in the rumen. Um, that rumen was stuffed full of fiber. On the BMR diet, much less U240. However, when we calculated the ratio of kilograms of U240 in the rumen relative to intake, we see that across the board, we came up with nearly the same number, which kind of was uh, astounding. And we, we later went back and looked at a few other trials and came up with very similar numbers. Um, so obviously we have clear treatment differences in these two rations, all four of these rations actually, but we thought, wow, what a coincidence that the ratio of U240 in the rumen to intake is almost constant. So a lot of effort and a lot of thought went into thinking there's a story to tell here and some mathematics to back calculate when we overfill the rumen with U240. Okay, um, my big caveat has always been U240 was not what was filling the rumen. U240 was simply an indicator of the larger piece of forage particle that it was associated with that was filling the rumen. Um, and I just, dis I distinguish between U240 of canola meal and beet pulp and soy hulls is not the same gut fill factor as uh, a forage particle U240 of forages. So I went back and with this COVID business, had plenty of time to sit on the couch and look at recalculating the NDF and the U240 contributions of the forage only of these same diets. And as we see here, the forage contribution on intake of these diets, the, the two high forage diets was identical. 6.9 kilos of forage NDF consumed in the high forage diets. 
the U240 undigested fiber from forage, 24-hour digestion, we get quite a difference. They consumed much less undigestible fiber on the BMR diet than they did on the high diet. In other words, the high undigest lower digestibility corn diet resulted in greater intake of slower digesting fiber. And the point I really want to make right here is the difference between these two numbers is NDF, forage NDF, that was degraded in the rumen. On this diet, we have what, basically three and a half kilos digested. On the high digestibility forage diet, we had nearly four, over four kilos, significantly more digested forage fiber in this diet. As a percent body weight, we've expressed it here, 0.5% of body weight as undigested NDF after 24 hours might be a new gut fill limit reference value. Looking at the low BMR, which we said was kind of acidotic, maybe 0.32% of forage dry matter um, is the, the minimum that we need to keep above to maintain a healthy rumen. We go down to just forage U240, those values are 0.31 and 0.2. And I throw that, I'm, this is me speaking. This doesn't, just, just me and my interpretation of these values is maybe these are new benchmarks um, to watch. And just remember they came from a heavy corn silage, grass silage based diet. So th this is the high corn si silage diet, and this was the NDF intake of that trial after putting it into NDS. So they ate 8.8 .8 kilos of total TMR NDF. Based on my best inputs of the grain mix, including UNDF and U30 values for all the grains, which I had to do by subtraction because I had the TMR UNDF profile and I had the forage UNDF profiles. And when I did the math, that's what was left over when I, you know, the grain, the total grain mix UNDF profile. So in this difference here, 8.8 .8 minus 3.2 leaves about 5.6 kilos of fast digesting NDF. And I've been recommending that that difference is your fast fiber and that when you can get this difference to be 1% of animal's body weight, you can make a lot of milk with a lot of forage. And I know Mike mentioned that in one of his talks um, at the CNC conference. So what I've done here is, is do that math for these diets. Uh, Total NDF intake, same as you saw before in the previous slide. This is the U30 number uh, of kilos of intake. And simple subtraction indicates that the fast NDF of the total TMR, grains and forages, was 5.6 kilos here. But when we have highly digestible forage, we can get that number up to almost seven kilos of rapidly digestible NDF. And here is where we get to 1% uh, of body weight. So animals were weighing about 670 kilos and only in this condition were they able to, uh, only in this condition were they fed enough forage in order to prove that they could consume 1% of their body weight is highly digestible fiber. These cows were forced to eat as much fiber as they possibly could, and they didn't have enough fast fiber. As you saw, dry matter intake was limited.
So hopefully that helps clarify some things. Um, the big take home message is just, just from these slides here is in that original trial, we had analyses of the total TMR and the forages and calculated the grain UNDF profile by difference. NDS provides quite a few numbers of UNDF values for non-forage fibers that may not be exactly the same as what we were using um, in the trial. And the other thought that I had is, is just tracking this total NDF minus total TMR NDF minus the total U30 value to get an estimate of your total load of fast fiber and a goal of attaining 1% of body weight as that value um, makes some profitable rations from what I see in my, in my area. The other thing, and last to consider, and th this is a work in progress, is keep in mind there are clear differences between grasses, legumes, climate interacting with the plants and management that will affect your UNDF profile. So those benchmarks, I can guarantee you, they're probably not going to be the same values as a percent body weight for a legume diet as what I was just showing you. But that's something where um, I ask that you track it on farm uh, to set your own benchmarks and, and use that as a tool, but not as a hard and fast rule. And with that, I think I'd like to pass it off to uh, Emiliano. Um, if we want to switch over to some diets. Yes. Um, I hope you can Let me, uh, all, share. all hear me. Yep. Okay. Do you see my NDS? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, before we actually jump on on NDS, I want to uh, give some extra information because um, you know this topic is becoming um, kind of uh, complex, and the reason why it's becoming complex is because we actually don't have a lot of numbers. Uh, so we we need to be patient, and as um, as Kurt said, you know, in his last slide, is that we can expect different numbers, you know, with different species, uh, different groups of forages. Uh, so I just put together some numbers from my previous uh, studies when I was um, in South Africa. Um, and by the way, you know, um, I'm I'm going to try to skip some some of the slides, but the concept I also wanted to add is that here we're talking about rumen fill, right? And rumen fill is driven by a lot of factors. So right now, we're only looking at some of those factors. Okay, so you can expect, obviously, yes, we're gonna have different numbers across species, but within the same, you know, cow, you're gonna have also different numbers across stage of lactation. Because we all know that uh, rumen fill or you know uh, or intake is going to be you know have a different um, weight given by the rumen fill. So sometimes intake is going to be driven more by uh, physical factors, sometimes by chemostatic factors. So that's why it's co kind of complex to make uh, you know to just give a, a few. Uh, numbers and guidelines, but you know, we kind of need to integrate these numbers related to NDF uh, into the whole, you know, system, uh, which is a very complex system. So again, just a, a few numbers. Uh, this is uh, um, a flow study uh, where we look at the, uh, you know, there was an interaction we. The, the main objective was uh, looking at the interaction between protein and forage digestibility, but I won't talk about this. But I only want to show you the um, the range of numbers in terms of uh, UNDF uh, 240. So you'll see it's 0 to 3, about 
there, you know, independent actually or of the digestibility of what I used, you know, in that diet. Uh, but if I show you diets actually that had alfalfa as the main forage, okay, so they were TMR based, uh, so alfalfa based TMR, so uh, very high quality alfalfa, and you can see, you know, what numbers I have there. So it's, you know, much higher than the ones that um, Kurt was showing. So benchmarks need to be seen within uh, the group of forage that I'm, I'm looking at. Okay. Then I also want to show you uh, some older numbers. So sometimes it's interesting how we kind of uh, put, you know, some previous works, put, it, put them aside and don't look at them because maybe they are out of time. So this was a study in 86. So they studied on efforts, cows and steers, and they looked at, you know, indigestible NDF estimated with UNDF 144. And I'm assuming, you know, it's, it's not that different than the 240. Okay, they had uh, all these animals they had offered at libitum ryegrass and sorghum silages. Okay, so they, you know, the cows themselves were actually managing uh, the consumption of forages. And they, they all had about 10, 12% of uh, uh, indigestible NDF on all diets, basically on all uh, intakes for both heifers and cows. But the interesting thing is that um, if we look at the, you know, this type of, um, of graph, you'll see that there is a, you know, kind of a broken line uh, just above 10% uh, of, uh, of the diet. And there was also an important effect of maturity of cattle. So they add, you know, heifers and mature cows, and the heifers actually add a much lower capacity in terms of uh, uh, indigestible NDF per metabolic body weight. So in this case, it's metabolic body weight, but you know, for body weight in general, uh, the rule uh, is still the same. Okay. Just a parenthesis, you know, for those of you that remember how the indigestible NDF was calculated previously, you know, we consider the 2.4 factor. In that same paper, that's what the authors wrote. So the indigestible NDF lignin relationship is different for all eight forages used, indicating again that the influence of lignin on digestibility is species dependent. Now I remind you that this was in 86, and the paper that we use for, you know, for the 2.4 factors was from 1982. So these, again, this paper was ignored, you know, basically until my PhD, which is, you know, it's, it's about 20 years. Uh, so again, I, I didn't discover anything basically in my PhD, but somebody else had already uh, done it. So I put together, uh, we put together uh, about 20 studies and Believe me, it was not easy to find data about indigestible NDF in, uh, in the studies. And I found exactly the same trend that Lipke, you know, and, and co-authors were showing. So there was a kind of a broken line uh, just above 10% of the uh, dry matter uh, intake in terms of indigestible NDF, okay? And in terms of uh, uh, about 2% of body weight, of metabolic body weight in this case. So the, the assumption or the hypothesis is that above 10, 11% in the diet, the animal would try to, uh, you know, to keep that rumen load of digestible NDF constant, basically by eating less at this rate. Okay? And for younger animals, uh, that capacity would be uh, much lower. And obviously here, I don't have uh, uh, data uh, for uh, younger uh, animals. And I'm assuming it's, uh, it's very difficult to find data within just the indigestible NDF and efforts, for example, at this stage at least. Um, so one other thing, and I want to mention this before I skip into the room and field tab, is that recently uh, the, uh, the group from Minor also suggested that the physical effective NDF could actually affect uh, the way, you know, that the cow could manage 
that load of indigestible fiber uh, in the rumen. So their assumption okay, is that the, uh, basically there is a, a, you know, an effect not only between tremor intake and UNDF240, okay, but that this relationship becomes stronger when I put the physical effective um, NDF into the equation. And, you know, from a mathematical point of view, that was true at least for all the studies uh, that they had uh, analyzed at Minor Institute. Um, so, and I did actually uh, one extra thing just to uh, confirm what Kurt said. Uh, this was, this where maybe Kurt can comment on this. Most of these diets were uh, corn silage based, I'm assuming with some grass. Uh, so now I don't recall, you know, what all the other studies were, but I'm assuming they were kind of similar in terms of, uh, of, of TMR uh, components. Now what I did, I added more studies in that figure. So these were the same studies that they did, um, you know, similar to what they did at, at Minor, but they did it uh, here in Italy using alpha-alpha uh, based TMRs. And you'll see where they actually are in terms of uh, P, U, and F. So completely outside of that, you know, that trend, okay? And these are other studies, some from mine uh, and others um, that I could include. Uh, again, it's difficult to find both indigestible NDF and physical effective NDF uh, in studies, okay? So let's, uh, uh, let's jump a second into um, NDS, okay? Here we have uh, the room and fill tab. And in this case, I have a, a diet that is made for um, a cow's 60 days in milk, making about 93, 94 pounds uh, of milk, okay? So I can expect that here, the rumen fill, okay, is mainly driven by physical factors, okay? So the assumptions that the rumen fill tab um, does, uh, makes, is that the intake, okay, is driven mainly by these factors, or at least the integration of these factors. So we've been talking about NDF uh, driving intake for many years, and now what we're trying to do is basically try to integrate or trying to fractionate that NDF in uh, uh, UNDF240, okay, which is the one here, then we're able to uh, give an estimation of the UNDF uh, in the rumen, and then, as a, an internal NDS calculation, we also calculate the, the ratio between the rumen UNDF and the intake UNDF. Remember that number in uh, Kurt's slides was about 1.6, 1 1.6 if I don't, uh, if I remember correctly. And then we have added uh, the PU NDF, which is the latest, basically index uh, that came out of Minor Institute. And then here the UNDF30, uh, which is, you know, in the original research uh, by Johnson co-authors basically was um, explained as a, some kind of uh, uh, proxy, pro proxal number, so an index of what the NDF, total NDF would be at any time in the, in the rumen. Okay. So the assumption with this UNDF30, so with this cows and with this diet, is uh, at any time, on average, the cow would have about six pounds, six or seven pounds of NDF. Okay. Now, as I said before, the assumption is that uh, these uh, are indices driving intake, okay, or driving rumen fill. So whatever change I make to the diet, NDS is going to assume that there will be a corresponding change in intake. Okay? So basically, if I make a change that is going to increase NDF intake, then obviously NDS is going to assume that there will be a decrease in the intake. Okay? And so depending on how these numbers change, okay, anytime I do a change in the diet, there will be an expected dry matter intake with a difference, and then based on the same diet, okay, and based on this 
uh, allowable milk uh, from energy and protein, the respective changes in terms of milk production that I can expect. Okay. Now, um, one last thing I, I need to say is that these UNDF okay, are computed basically from all the C uh, fraction uh, from carbohydrates okay, in, the, uh, in the diet. And you know that these C fractions are estimated, um, you know, are suggested to be estimated using the UNDF 240. But if I will not have that analysis uh, from the lab, then the NDS will assume that um, it can use uh, ADL times 2.4 to estimate the C fraction. Okay. So obviously, as Kurt was saying, you can have some kind of a, um, disagreement on how these numbers are obtained if I don't have all the UNDF 240 or UNDF or UNDF 120 uh, if I'm talking uh, for non-forage uh, fiber. Okay, then the other thing I wanted to add is that this number is uh, coming considering only the forage fiber sources because that was the original idea uh, of uh, you know when this concept came out uh, in the literature. Okay, so we re we we kept that definition. Okay, so I have this diet um, and I have the main forage, the corn silage, uh, and then other two forages, Timothy hay and alpha alpha hay. So, and you can see here that I have also a BMR, and I try to select uh, this BMR as being very similar. Okay, to this corn silage in terms of NDF, starch, protein. So obviously I can expect, you know, difference being um, in the KD of the NDF uh, and obviously in the UNDF 240. Okay, so we know that BMR corn silages have a, have a lower, um, normally, okay, on average, they have a lower UNDF uh, 240. So my idea is just to show you uh, just a change in the diet. So in this case, I want to replace um, some of this corn silage, so I choose to replace 17 pounds and add 17 uh, of this BMR. Okay, so right away, uh, the you will see that you know uh, the initial recipe here, okay, and then the current recipe here. So with all the uh, with all the changes, so you see that the dry matter intake uh, is slightly different because probably the dry matter of these two corn silages are not the same, so there is a small changes, even if the, you know, as fed total uh, is the same. Uh, okay, we can we can ignore this because it's, it's a very small difference. Then NDF intake, it went from 18.9 to 18 point basically 8, okay? And the, the system tells you that there is a small, uh, you know, increase uh, uh, from the, uh, sorry, that the dry matter can increase of 0.3 pounds because of this lower uh, NDF. So, and this is the corresponding, you know, uh, expected increase of yield uh, that I can have. So, similar thing is with the UNDF intake. So, from 5.2 went down to uh, 5 points, so from 1.25 to 5.2, so it's a very small difference in terms of UNDF intake, but that small difference is taken into consideration when the expected milk production is um, is calculated here. The same thing is with the UNDF uh, rumen, so assuming the UNDF uh, in the rumen is the one driving the uh, the rumen fill, then the ratio again is uh, is basically uh, no difference, and then the P UNDF. As I told you before, right, is is basically computed uh, multiplying the PEF factor, right, for the UNDF of that diet. Now here it's an in interesting case, and you'll see the number as a different sign than the other ones. Okay, so if you see the numbers, it goes from 3.07 to 3.2. Okay, so that means. With the with the current recipe, so with the more BMR, okay, I actually have a higher content of PUNDF, okay, and because I have this higher content of PUNDF, I can expect a reduction of intake 
in this uh, with this BMR. So this is kind of a counter, you know, intuitive. So it's going the opposite way because of a um, of a of something that I didn't consider. So these two corn silages actually have been ground uh, differently. So they have a, a different physical effective NDF. So that's why uh, with this BMR that was chopped actually coarser, I can expect uh, you know a reduction of intake if I assume that the PUNDF is the one driving the uh, the rumen field. So in that case, uh, if this is true, so if this hypothesis is true, I can expect actually a reduction of of milk production, just because this you know is uh, is not as fine uh, as the previous uh, corn silage. And then I uh, I see the UNDF 30 intake. And now remember I said before that the, uh, this one consider only the ones coming from the forages. This um, warning sign tells you that I actually don't have all the time points, or actually I don't have the time point of digestibility at, at 30 hours. So that's why uh, I should not take this into consideration. And in fact. Look at the numbers are completely uh, wrong, just because you know I don't have all the time points. Uh, so there is some other uh, information that I can uh, you know expect. So uh, obviously I don't consider this number because again it's not uh, correct. Uh, and then you can see here all the uh, possibilities so that can happen. So if I this is, was the initial uh, intake. Okay, that I had. So this was my intake measured at the at the farm, so 56 pounds. And then what I can expect if I change, you know, 17 pounds uh, with that new BMR. So again, there is no right or wrong number, but the the uh, the objective here with the rumen field tab was to show you uh, what the trend could be, uh, assuming. Uh, all these different uh, hypotheses relating, uh, you know, measurements of NDF uh, to the uh, to the intake. Uh, while we talk about this, I want to I want to briefly uh, driving you into the particle size tool because uh, sometimes uh, when we look at this number, especially this type of numbers, we can actually have better measurements if I go and measure. Uh, the particle size of the uh, of the TMR. So I will not uh, go through the through the numbers, uh, but please be aware that you know right now I have a, a 0 0.61 estimated physical effective factor. Okay, so this number is estimated only through the numbers that each of these obviously especially forages uh, have within. The, the feed information, so the feed analysis. Okay, so they might be book values, they might be real values, uh, but doing just a simple, you know, measurements of the particle size of the of the TMR will, you know, calculate uh, will allow you to calculate the new or the real, the observed PEF uh, factor. Um, so actually, while we're talking, I can just put some numbers here. Um, let's see. And just quickly show you. So, see the observed uh, PEF factor is a little bit higher than the estimated one. Okay? So that means that there must be one or more of these forages that actually have higher uh, PENDF than the one that is um, recorded in the in the information of each feed. Okay, so then I'm. Uh, the, our suggestion is actually to go and change uh, this PENDF, okay, according to uh, our, um, you know, obviously, uh, ob try to be. We'll try to be objective according to what we see at the farm, and then we can choose to, uh, you know, to change these numbers uh, for at the pen level for the feed or the uh, for the lactating dairy cow. Okay, um, I think. Uh, and then obviously once I change these numbers, okay, I save the recipe, uh, and then obviously this number might become uh, more correct actually than what it is, because again, if I don't have a, a 
reliable number of physical effective MDF, then this number will not be uh, reliable either. Um, I'm not sure if you, Kurt, or uh, Erman, or Dave, you want to add uh, something? Usually when we're doing those TMR shakes, whether we're using the Z box or the pin box, usually that number comes out. Your example was really nice. Um, our observed PENDF will usually be lower than our estimated. And so if you'll just change your change your bottom pan to 120 and uh, so now you would go back and change the values over there, which will lower in this screen. You'll see the PENDF go down and everything. And so I, this has been kind of the fun thing. And I think when I first started using NDS and I saw this in here, uh, it was really a phenomenal tool um, to, to work with on, on the fiber side. So you've made the correction, and you can see the adjustment down. Yep. And so the the real value we need to know is what are our cows eating. And right. So this right. Is a phenomenal tool. Yeah, I I just wanted to mention this because sometimes uh, we don't you know uh, realize that you know these all these numbers can be connected to other tools you know that of what we do. Um, in the uh, of what we see, you know, in in NDS, so we need to kind of integrate everything, and you'll see that this number already changed because of our new P NDS. And obviously, you know, you can use also the uh, the Z box, that in that case, uh, you know, will not give you. A distribution of the particle size, but we will it will still give you uh, the estimated uh, the observed PEF value. Yeah, that, that's that's a good tool, Emiliano. You you had mentioned, uh, I I believe most of those minor trials that you had in the previous uh, figure were corn silage base, but there were a number of trials that were heavy on the non-forage fiber sources included there as well. So yep. you had quite a range of ration ingredients. And the PENDF study that um, Wyatt Smith did at Minor, that was, uh, I think we should go through a presentation on that alone someday. Uh, what he did was uh, quite a fair portion of, uh, it was long Timothy Hay that was either. Timothy, yeah, I remember it was Timothy. Yeah. It was really low digestibility and they ground it quite fine versus leaving it partially ground. And there was significant intake differences, um, greater intake, the smaller the particles, the less time they spent eating. In other words, they consumed it much more easily. Um, and actually, uh, avoided gut fill limits because they were able to clear it out of the room and quicker being shorter mm. to begin with. Yes. Yeah. I was I was just going to open the BMR only because I I actually deleted on purpose the, the 30 hours. Um, you'll see. See, it's not here. Um, any, uh, let's take a look at the questions. Anybody inquiring? I think they're all getting answered well. Okay. Yeah. You'll see. You'll see now that the UNDF30, you know, doesn't have that uh, warning sign anymore, uh, and you know, it's giving you uh, a prediction of increased, you know, uh, milk production based on this hypothesis. The UNDF30. Is the the driver for room and fuel? So, can I ask you a difficult question? Yes, Hermano will answer. 
<laughs> so if you go back to the room and fill, if you put cotton seed in that recipe, then yep. then you know it the UNDF thirty intake number basically was looking at including cotton in that. And so I think you've chosen Oh. Yeah, go go put a pound of that in. Or sorry, yes, we're in English, so you can see now. You might need to open that cotton seed because the the little trick that we did was going back to the lab and keeping that described as a concentrate. And again, when you get further down south, you may have that discussion, but it is still a concentrate. And uh, go ahead and and see what we did with the uh, uh, constant calculations NDFDs. Oh, sorry. So this was just as we were playing with it, and I'm not sure, you know, trying to do the workaround to utilize that. So we have the a 30 hour uh, put in there. Yeah. Okay. And again, what we did is we took the 1272-120 from the data set that the labs were getting, and then we also got a 30 from them and used that in there. So not to complex that. So any other questions we need to? It looks like uh, we're getting those answered. Can I? To um, there's a question regarding, you know, when you have a difference between the PEUNDF prediction and the UNDF. Um, I see Romano's already answered it, but uh, my my opinion is NDF digestibility trumps particle size. Um, and we've seen that in shredlage research and with long, highly digestible fiber, they're still able to eat it quicker and digest it quicker. So. I think um, if if you do run into some plus plus pluses and then a minus and P E U and E F, it's it's more a pause to think. Um, is you know, is this straw fiber, P E U and E F, or is this you know, fresh pasture ryegrass P E U and E F, or P E F? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, right. obviously things will change based on the specific kind of NDF, yeah. 